Well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our uh, call to worship this morning is from the 119th Psalm, verses 169 through 173. And that's found on page 558 of the Church Bible. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Let my lips utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. Let my tongue sing of your word, for all your commandments are righteous. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live that it may praise you, and let your ordinance, ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Oops, sorry, I went a little long. I got carried away. Um, Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be here today. We do long for understanding of your ways. Your ways are sometimes mysterious to all of us, but we know your ways are right and righteous. Give us the patience to wait for that understanding always, because you know, we know that you will always do good for us. In Jesus' name we pray. That was a good prayer, Bill. Amen to that. Uh, morning, church. Um, Lord bless you for uh, being here this hour this day. Um, on a beautiful day that he's made, uh, even though it's chilly. Um, that being said, um, let me move to uh, please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. Greatly appreciate that. And I trust that you had a wonderful and blessed Thanksgiving uh, with your loved ones. Um, who had a great Thanksgiving? All right, awesome. Okay, don't raise your hand if you didn't have a good Thanksgiving. I don't, I don't, I don't want to know that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, very quickly, uh, we're back to uh, Wednesday prayer and Bible study, uh, James chapter 1. We're going to look at the, a section about uh, how uh, temptation brings forth sin, how we're tempted and how it, it's progressive and it moves toward sin. Uh, also, uh, we have a women's prayer uh, meeting this coming Thursday morning in the sanctuary. Uh, discipleship class after uh, the service this morning um, in the other building. And then this is something that you want to mark down. Uh, we, we've always had a, a great Christmas party. It'll be Wednesday night the 13th. We won't have our traditional prayer and Bible study, um, but we'll have a Christmas party. It will begin at 6 o'clock, not 7. All right, a Yankee swap, um, it's a side dish to share, or a dish to share. Uh, and where is Liz Gillette? Liz, Liz is going to coordinate the food for that. Uh, so. Either Jeanette or myself. If okay. you have something, um, it's a potluck. So if you have something, if you want to add to the Okay. All right. Um, we have the shoebox ministry going on, um, and you can either um, do it online yourself or, I guess, uh, donate, uh, uh, give the money. Uh, Jerry, where is, that? is there a box back there, or is it just give it to Jane or yourself? For the, For the shoebox, yes. There's envelopes. Envelopes, there. okay. Right, so if, if you are not interested in doing it online or you know, computer savvy, get an envelope. You can put a donation that way and then somebody will take care of it. Okay, I appreciate your giving in advance to that ministry. Um, and th that's all I have this morning. Anything else for the good of the congregation? If, if you do a shoebox online or after you order, we've added little shoeboxes on the wreath at the table to keep track of the number of shoeboxes we're serving as a church. Okay. 
All right, great. All right. Okay, if there's nothing else, Bob's going to come and lead us in our next song. Our tithes and offering verse this morning is the first verse of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Heavenly Father, we believe this, you are our Lord. We know that we shall never want. Please bless the gift that we are all about to give into your ministry today. In Jesus' name we pray.
Uh, folks, uh, let me just uh, give you an update on Dave Norcross as I was um, doing so in Sunday school this morning. Dave's surgery has been postponed because of um, discrepancies over who's going to cover the surgery. So um, anyway, pray for Dave and um, hopefully that gets resolved uh, early this week and uh, also pray that they'll um, reschedule his surgery quickly. And um, keep Keith Johnson in your prayers. Uh, Keith's had a heart issue. They didn't amputate the foot. Um, I've been praying that God would um, remove that um, infection from his foot so he wouldn't have to lose it. I hope that you'll pray that uh, prayer along with me, but obviously God's will be done. Um, Mickey, still in life care. I saw Fred Legler the other week. Um, Jerry Hartgrove's moved to Rochester and uh, is get, getting settled in. Uh, and then last but not least, we have um, Cindy Ellis's situation and uh, Edie Jackson. A lot of needs. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, rather than just me pray this morning, I'd like to open it up to the congregation um, and um, pray as you feel led. I'll close.
so that uh, no one will be lost, Lord God, that, uh, that you desire for yourself. And um, I, I just pray that your light will shine from us like a beacon. And say, come, find the Lord and be with him because there is your peace and there is your rest and there is your hope. And there is your future eternal. And we praise you and thank you, dear Lord God, for all that you have given us and continue to give us and the, the strength that you give us to um, just joyfully seek your presence every day as we watch the news and see what's going on in the world that we that we can be that better way that you present to others. Hmm. That one way, the only way. Praise you, Lord, and thank you for that. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your presence this morning in this place as we gather with your people. And we pray that you would cause a stillness to come over our soul. Uh, that we would sense your presence and that we would also, Lord, sense when you uh, visit us in this service uh, in some particular way uh, that we would sense your coming to us. Um, we pray that we would be still. We pray that your presence would give us uh, great joy and comfort and peace and we pray that you Lord would minister uh, to each heart uh, this morning as Martha's prayed a lot going on in the world many distractions many things that uh, afflict the spirit many um, needs um, and uh, and as she rightly prayed living in quiet desperation and um, we, we pray that you would focus people uh, to the cross, um, focus people uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, hope and peace and joy and strength and comfort, uh, everything uh, that anyone could ever desire or ask for. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would lift up Christ in this place this morning. Uh, we pray that we would have the opportunity to witness for you this upcoming week and to speak of the glories of Christ and great things that he has done for us and great things that he has 
um, done in the past uh, in history and great things that he's going to do in the future. And I pray that you would put uh, those opportunities before us, that you would give us eyes to be able to see those opportunities and a holy boldness, Lord, to uh, trust your spirit to lead and guide us in those opportunities as we uh, witness and um, lift up Christ. Uh, Father, I want to lift up Annie this morning, and I pray that you would give uh, uh, answer to Paulette's prayers, and we pray that you would uh, touch Annie, Annie, that she might be uh, able to feel better. Uh, also, Father, um, I pray that you would uh, touch Keith's foot. It's our prayer that you would uh, divinely um, fight against that infection, that he wouldn't have to lose part of his foot. Uh, we pray that he would get the right treatment for uh, his heart condition as well. I also um, pray that you would be with Patricia Fogal in uh, the next uh, week and a half or two as she undergoes her heart procedure. Uh, give her strength to be able to come through that um, exceptionally well. Um, pray, Father, this morning um, that you would allow Jerry Hartgrove to sense your presence and give him peace. Um, and thank you that he's near his children. Um, we lift him up this morning. And also, uh, Father, especially Dave, um, great peace and comfort uh, with the procedure that's been put off tomorrow. Um, we know somehow you're in that. And yet I uh, pray that Dave would um, just be so full of your grace and peace um, that it doesn't afflict his spirit or bother him in any way as it has bothered me for him. Um, Father, thank you uh, for Cindy's prayer this morning and the testimony of you um, being there with her parents and uh, through very, very difficult circumstances and situations. And I think of the scripture, Lord, when, when one hurts, we all hurt. And I pray that you would give uh, Cindy relief. Uh, and um, thank you for uh, uh, all the care and the love that has been poured out uh, to her parents in uh, that situation. And we pray that you would um, divinely reach into the hearts of other uh, family members and bring um, encouragement and conviction and a faithfulness and a love um, if it's not uh, being shown there. Um, we pray that you would continue to give her great strength and great grace and great peace um, to minister to her parents and to her family. Uh, and then, uh, Father, also I think of Mickey and Edie as well. Uh, visit them, Lord, in the quietness of their rooms and in the quietness of their hearts and uh, encourage them uh, in the things of God. And, Lord, uh, last but not least, I think of uh, our hearts here. Uh, there's a lot of needs in uh, this church this morning. Uh, we don't say much. Um, and we don't always uh, share much. Um, but there's um, many, many things in our life, in our heart, um, that we're not settled with, or maybe we're troubled with, or we're still trying to figure out, um, or just give to you. Um, a lot of things, Lord, that we need to give to you. And I pray that you would help us uh, this morning in some small way uh, to be able to do that and to move forward and um, uh, that we might be the people that you want us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, uh, we have uh, Misty Choir. You're going to bless us with special music, right?
Thank you, choir. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 21, and that's found on page 958 of the Church Bible. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat and immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is the gospel of our Lord. Okay, folks, our uh, next song, uh, The Lord's My Shepherd, is here.
Our second scripture reading this morning is from the book of Revelation, the third chapter, verses 14 through 22. And that's found on page 1112 of the Church Bible. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This too is the word of our Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, I pray that what you've laid upon my heart, um, your Holy Spirit would communicate to your people. And I pray that you would give insight and understanding this morning as only you can do. And we give you this time and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, folks, some of you may have heard about the fable of the drowning man. Uh, as I begin to read this, some of it, you might be very familiar with it. So, uh, a fellow was stuck on his rooftop in a flood, and he was praying to God for help. And soon, a man in a rowboat came by, and, and the fellow shouted to the man on the roof, Jump in, I can save you. The fellow, the stranded fellow, shouted back, No, no, it's okay, I'm praying to God that he's going to save me. So the rowboat went on. Then a motorboat came by and the fellow in the motorboat shouted, shouted, jump in, I can save you. And the stranded man said again, no, no thanks, I'm praying to God that he's going to save me, I have faith. And so the motorboat went on. And then a helicopter came by and the pilot shouted, grab the rope and I will lift you to safety. And the stranded man again replied, no thanks, I'm praying to God and he's going to save me. I have faith, and so the helicopter reluctantly flew away. And soon the water rose over the rooftop, the man drowned, he went to heaven, and he finally got his chance to discuss the whole situation with God, to which he said, I had faith in you, but you didn't save me, you let me down, you let me drown. Uh, I, I don't understand, and, and to God, God said to him, well, I sent you a rowboat, I sent you a motorboat, and a helicopter, what more did you expect, right? <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to slice and dice the fable, right? And the morals of this. Um, one guy by the, uh, cited by Wikipedia by the name of Mathai wrote, this story has many morals that divine providence takes many forms, that our community around us offers many examples of holiness in action, 
and that we should not keep waiting for miracles to occur when human agency may be all that is needed. Uh, that we would be foolish to squander the opportunities that, we, that may be right in front of us in favor of the highly unlikely million to one chance. Now, I, I think that that's a right perspective, but let me share with you another take from this. Do you and I recognize the time of God's visitation to us? Whether it's to get us out of a jam, or whether it comes to him leading and guiding us in a particular matter, or when it comes to God teaching us something. Do we recognize the time of his visitation? Now, I mention that because I've been thinking about Advent. Today's the first Sunday of the Advent season. It's, you know, where we begin to count down the Sundays, if you will, to the birth of Christ. And, uh, you know, it's like, I was thinking about Advent, and the definition for Advent is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. And so we celebrate the arrival of Christ, the event of Christmas. That is notable, and it's totally changed the course and dynamic of all of history. Now, that's not to say that we're oblivious to Christ coming the rest of the year, but it's where we start to really focus and we marvel at the miracle of Christmas. Now, regarding Advent, what we do in Christian theology, we break up the Advent into two nicely separated events. The first event is the coming of God, where he became man, we call this the incarnation of God, Christmas, right? That's why we celebrate it. The second coming is where we're talking about the resurrected Lord Jesus coming on the clouds to change this whole world system and to destroy his enemies. And we celebrate that perspective because I look forward, and I don't know about you, but I look forward to when God rolls up all of this evil that we see in this world and that he crushes this world system. I, oh, oh my goodness, I cannot wait. It's going to be a glorious day. Maybe not so glorious for some people who resist that, but it will be a wonderful and glorious day when God comes. But this is what's very, very clear from Scripture. Many, like the guy on the rooftop, many people miss the first coming of God, and many people will miss the second coming of God. And I started to think about this. Think of it. First and foremost, it was the religious people that could not assess the time of his visitation and the day. And that extended to the people. I mean, think about this. The experts in the law and the scriptures, and they totally missed it. Now, uh, just as an aside, I'm convinced that many experts today are wrong on a lot of things. And I don't, uh, I'm not the only one that has that opinion. I mean, all these people, all these experts, you know, they, they, get, they get so expert in something, like this one little thing that they miss the big picture, right? And so are they really an expert after all? Not sure about that. Also, according to Christ's teachings, right, just like is in the days of Noah, Right? There's going to be eating and drinking and giving in marriage. And you get the sense from his teaching that people aren't going to be ready. Because they're going about there every, every day. You know, I remind people, but where you and I are now, this whole place was underwater a long time ago. That's what the Word of God teaches. Right? We forget that. And we forget that when God comes, I mean, I mean it's going to... It's going to be a day to behold, and you want to be ready. So all of this got me thinking, as we prepare for the Advent season, do we recognize the time of God's visitation? How do we recognize it? How do we recognize that when he comes 
to help us search out a matter or a situation? Do, do I sense his coming? Do I sense when he speaks to my heart? Do I sense when his spirit prods me to move in a certain direction or to witness to a certain person or to make a certain decision? I think this, it's huge, folks. Totally huge. And as I was thinking about this and praying over it, Revelation chapter 3 just kept on coming back to my heart and my mind at the church in Laodicea. And you notice in verse 20 it says that he stood at the door and knocked. Now, when you read this section here to this church, uh, the picture of the church in Laodicea is not a good one, right? Um, God said they were poor and blind and naked. Yeah, sometimes I felt like that. Luke, uh, wished, uh, they're lukewarm. He wished that they were hot or cold, like get off the fence. Yes, I sometimes have been like that. And so I was looking at this. Is this not a very, very good spiritual environment in which to recognize the time of God's visitation, right? But, you know, God told the Apostle John to write this down. I, I stand at the door and knock. Notice that it's in the present tense. And there's opportunity here. It's constantly in the present. I stand at the door and knock. And God doesn't go away. And what hopefully happens is one responds when they hear the knocking. And hopefully one opens the door when they hear him knock. How many times have you had that, that dreaded knock on your door, right? Maybe it's a Saturday morning. Um, maybe it's a doorbell rather than a knock. But it's come unexpectedly. We're caught off guard. Maybe we're still in our robe. Maybe we haven't showered. Or maybe we're not dressed. And, you know, um, maybe... We have the luxury of not signing for something, right? A lot of times, maybe they'll knock on the door and just leave the package. Other times, they want the dreaded signature, right? And it's like, oh my goodness, who's going to go to the door, right? It's a relief when they just don't need a signature. I started to think. I'm doing a lot of thinking lately. What about, what about God's signature card? of events, his calling, his knocking in scripture. I'm thinking about that. You know, he doesn't come and ask for a signature. He comes and asks that the door would be open, that we would hear and that we would respond. And so, do we recognize those moments? Do we know them when we see them? Do we have ears to hear when God comes to us? Are the spiritual antennas up to recognize that moment? And I think that that is hugely important to spiritual life and spiritual well-being. You know, there's a lot of churches that just like, everything's like all black and white. And I'm not kind of like exactly like that. I believe that God is alive in his spirit and that he comes to us and he knocks and he tries to get our attention. Amen. I mean, he's alive today. Why not? Last evening, as I was meditating on this, my mind and heart went back to 1 Samuel chapter 3. This is a classic passage of, you know, young Samuel is in the temple with Eli. Eli's old and his eyes are failing him. And, um, and so young Samuel is attending to Eli and they both lay down and the scripture says that the lamp of God had not gone out. And next thing you know, you hear Samuel. And so Samuel goes running to Eli. You know the account, right? And, and he does it three times. And, and Samuel's like, Eli, you called. And he's like, I didn't call you. 
I didn't call you. I didn't call you. And then the scripture says that Eli perceived that it was the Lord. He discerned that it was the Lord who was calling Samuel. Also in that passage, it says that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And so what we have here is a contrast. Eli, a seasoned man of God, although not in the greatest spiritual light as presented in scripture, could hear and recognize when God was calling and yet Samuel was young and could not. It, it comes down to spiritual experience and spiritual sensing and discerning of the moment, does it not? Now, you might ask the question, well, how might he come to us? You know, he came to the apostles um, late at night when they were in, in, in the boat. And God shows up at very, very unexpected times. You can't put a clock to it. So just for kicks and giggles, what I did, I, I searched the internet uh, for articles um, about how God might speak or visit. Now, I know based on my personal experiences, but I wanted to see what other people would have to say. And I wasn't really surprised at some of the answers because there was definitely some overlap. But anyway, um, I found nine articles. <laughs> and, and so um, one article said eight ways in which God speaks and comes to us. And then there was another article that said six ways in which God speaks and comes to us. And then there was another article that said there's four ways in which God comes and speaks to us. And then there was another one I found that said five ways that God comes and speaks to us. And then another one said eight ways, and the eight ways on the two different eight ways weren't exactly the same. And then another one was seven ways and 12 ways and 10 ways. Now, you might, you might be saying, well, pastor, what is it? <laughs> okay. How many, how many ways can God come to us? This is the right answer. Those articles aren't necessarily wrong in and of themselves. It's based on what people have personally experienced. That's why one would say 12 and 10 and 7 and 5 and 4 and 8 and 6. Because it's all over the place. Because it, it's based on their personal experience. Now, what I will tell you is this. That all of those articles are an incomplete listing of how might God come to us. They're not necessarily wrong, but they're incomplete. What I will say is this, you always have to start with a biblical framework so I can filter all of this life and my personal experiences through the word of God. That is first and foremost. Um, I like to say, uh, you know, a biblical framework because you know, pictures always look good in a frame, don't they? Biblical concepts always look good when they're famed, framed, or, or principles are, are good when they're framed. But here's the right answer. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and through 2a, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us through his son. So it's not the 10 or the 12 or the 8. It's potentially way more than that. It's many portions and in many ways and in his son. So what I tried to do here is I, for the sake of you folks, I went and I made a list of all these various and diverse ways in which God showed up in scripture. It's not exhaustive, but let me frame it into two categories. He either came to people but based on the scriptural accounts. He came in grace and truth and peace, much like the first advent of Christ. He came in grace and truth and peace. And then he came in judgment, much like the second advent will be. Right? So here's the list. Genesis chapter 3, God calmly walked, entered into the garden, and like, where are you guys? Right? And then with Enoch... God came, he just took them, <laughs> right? And then God spoke with Noah, and with Abraham, the Lord appeared to him, 
And with Jacob and Joseph, it was dreams and visions. And with Balaam, it was a donkey. And with Moses, it was a burning bush and the tent of meeting. And at Mount Sinai, it was fire and an earthquake. And in the wilderness, it was a pillar and a cloud. And with the Egyptians, it was 10 plagues. And with Jonah, it was a big fish and a gourd. And with Elijah, it was a soft whisper after the wind and the earthquake and the fire had passed. And with Elijah, I'm mean, with uh, uh, Isaiah, it was a vision. With the Hebrew lads, it was a stroll in the fiery furnace. With Daniel, it was in dreams and handwriting on the wall and the lion's den. With Nehemiah, get this, God came and gave him a burden. With Habakkuk, he patiently waited like a watchman on the wall. In other Old Testament circumstances, we have God visiting with bears and lions, a fire and a sword, and here you go, through Samson. Right? And then when we come to the New Testament, it's the incarnation of his son, angelic appearances, and post-resurrection appearances. And in the upper room, it was like a mighty rushing wind when God sent his spirit to descend and to dwell on his people. With St. Paul, it was the Damascus Road experience and being caught up to the third heaven. And with the Apostle John, the scripture says he was in the spirit. Now, I don't know, I just, I don't know how many points are there. Maybe I should write an article and say, you know, oh, the 27 different ways in which God might come and visit. But I won't do that because it might be 127 or 227. Amen? And so the right answer is in many portions and in various ways. And that was true in the Old Testament, and that's true in the New Testament. And, and to me, it doesn't matter how many which ways. What really matters is this, is that we recognize and realize the time of his visitation to us. That's what is most important. Now, uh, let me shift gears here a little bit after I take a drink of water. Years ago, I said in a sermon, he speaks to me. By saying that, someone who was attending the church at the time, they're in glory now, but a dear friend said to me, they challenged me on that. They said, God doesn't, how does God speak to you, right? They took issue with, with the, the word God speaks. I was not implying that I hear audible voices Okay, usually when that happens, you're sitting in like an asylum someplace, okay? Uh, I don't, I, ne I, I do not hear an audible voice. I never heard an audible voice. And who knows, I probably will never hear an audible voice. Poor, poor choice of words. And I think you know by now in this message, what I'm referring to is when God comes to us spiritually in the ways, various ways in which he might. I was referring to when God visits me in my heart and my mind. When he speaks through the Holy Spirit to my spirit. Because he does. And maybe quickens, he quickens is a better way to express it than to say that he speaks. But I'm referring to where he divinely brings situations and circumstances all together. And you know without a shadow of a doubt that this is what God wants you to do. I've had this happen very often. And I trust and hope that you have had too. I know when he leads me to do something and when he guides me to do something. Uh, there are times where I absolutely know it clearly as to what I'm to preach on. And there are other times where I see it dimly, but I still know that that's what I'm to preach on. And so, I'm sharing with you my personal conviction, but also what I believe to be true based on Holy Scripture. God is alive, and because he is alive and he lives within the heart, he visits, and he quickens, and he gets our attention, and he stands there and knocks. Amen? He has to. It's, 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 this is a living word, right? So... God still speaks through his son, using the scriptures in and through the spirit, and using whatever he wants 
to get my attention or to, to get your attention. Uh, maybe it's something that somebody said. Maybe it's a news article that you read. Maybe perhaps it's something in our environment, uh, extenuating circumstances and situations in our family. Uh, maybe it's something in nature like the modern day fig tree, you know? You walk by and you, you take a look at a tree and you say, hmm, that's dying. And then God quickens your spirit and takes you to something else where, um, you know, you have application to culture, society, a situation. However, he might apply it, right? Scripture is a framework, and yet look for God's visitation in the spirit to quicken in regard to when he visits. Now, let me say this. I don't think that what I just shared with you is outside the mainstream or scope of the pages of Scripture. What I think is outside the mainstream is when we don't have those experiences. That's what I think is outside the mainstream. When we are dead to God visiting us in our heart, our mind, our spirit, that's outside the mainstream. What's in the mainstream is recognizing these things. One final thought in answer to the potential question, how might we recognize the time of God's visitation in uh, diverse and various ways? Um, I came up with that correct question. I think it's a great question, okay? Um, because it's, because he comes in diverse and various ways, I, I don't have a simple answer for you. It's complex. I can't tell you when God might come. What I will say is this. Recognize that a spiritual visitation has everything to do with the spiritual environment that's cultivated in the heart and the mind. Now, in my opinion and my experience, the spiritually prepared heart is the spiritually advantaged heart. That's where we can see God move and we can see those occasions. Uh, as for this, uh, the church in Laodicea, uh, we know that they were not spiritually prepared. They didn't spiritually cultivate the soil. They didn't have good ground. They didn't have a good environment um, to quicken their spirits or recognize these things. And yet this is what I don't want you to miss. God still gave them opportunity to recognize that he was knocking. Isn't that amazing? They're in a spiritual stupor. They're not in a spiritually good place. And yet God visited them and gave them the opportunity to recognize it. Now, did they know he was knocking? I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't part, wasn't part of that church. It's a spiritual thing. But I do know that he gave them opportunity in the condition that they were in. Now, I'm not a betting man, thank God. Um, but if I may put this in, better, in, in betting terms, the opportunity is there, but the odds are not too favorable to recognize the times of God's visitation when the conditions are not cultivated properly. It's kind of like getting, you know, fruit from a tree or getting, you know, vegetables from the ground. You have to have the ground properly cultivated to get fruit from it. And that's what I do know is that we're always way better off to see the visitation of God in our hearts and minds when the, the, the area of the heart and the mind is cultivated properly. So that's just a, a pretty basic observation, and I think it's a, a true observation. Uh, in closing, back to the uh, fable of the, ground, uh, the drowning man. Um, <laughs> there was more than ample opportunity. I mean, God gave the guy th you know, three opportunities to hear, to assess, and to find him in the moment. Um, you know, God may give us way more opportunities than just three, uh, but he does give us opportunity to assess, to hear, and to find him in the various moments. And um, I think those are Advent moments. And as we move into the Advent season uh, and we celebrate the Lord's coming to us, look for the various ways in which he, he, might he visit, might, in which he might visit us spiritually in our hearts and our minds this Christmas season. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, thank you for your presence 
in this place today and thank you for your presence in our lives. Uh, we know that you are living and we know that the word of God is living and active and um, sharp, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we um, know that you're living and you live within our hearts and because of that, uh, because you're a person and you're alive, uh, we know that you come to us and want to visit and sup and, uh, and allow us to joy, enjoy our moments with you. And um, we thank you for the times where uh, we recognize when you visit. Uh, please give us the grace, the heart, the mind, uh, the spirit, the insight to know uh, when you come and visit and when you knock and when you speak to our hearts. Uh, and what a wonderful, wonderful uh, privilege uh, and opportunity it is to uh, open the door uh, when you knock on our hearts. Uh, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for the word of God and how it stands forever. And thank you for each heart that's here. Uh, we bless you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, our, our closing hymn is 791. I, I, have, a, I, I have a chuckle because um, this was listed in our bulletin on, th th uh, on Wednesday night. And uh, I had the wrong, the wrong number, but these words. So anyway, we're going to sing seven, 791. Jesus, I just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm.